Hi everyone, I'm Ken Fisher of Atigro. Welcome to our virtual coffee series, Leaders Adapt to the New Normal. Today we focus on mobilizing your workforce and streamlining costs. And then we also have our recurring segment of Ask the SBA, where audience can ask questions directly of our favorite loan officer, Rod Johnson. That's our mascot, in case you're wondering, his name's Dart. So our strategic partners in my company, Tigra, have put together this series to address issues that are top of mind to small and medium business owners and executives. We intend to continue the series throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. We think a lot of the changes in how we're doing business will be with us for some time to come. Our desire is to provide business owners and executives actionable information so they make informed decisions about how to adapt their organizations to the new normal. This week, we're gonna hear from Tom Collins of Atlantic Online Brian Vaughn of ShipShape IT, on, uh, both who speak on mobilizing your workforce. We'll also hear tips on how to streamline costs from Mark Friedman of Expense to Profit. We'll wrap up with a question and answer period from our favorite US Small Business Administration loan officer, Rod Johnson. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. These sponsors have made it possible to reach out to the community as well as provide support for these events. In addition to our partner sponsors, we have two community sponsors for this event to help us spread the word, Special Needs Alliance and Tyson's Regional Chamber of Commerce. If, you're fe if you feel like we're providing a service to the business community on these forums, we would like to invite you to help us spread the word. When you see an upcoming email uh, about an event, sorry, an upcoming event email, please send it to others. And if you see one of our LinkedIn posts, please like and comment on it We'd greatly appreciate it. Some quick housekeeping tips in order to keep the conversation orderly. I will be asking all questions of our panelists, which I'll get from the audience. Please use the chat feature to ask your questions. I do have your questions that you've already submitted, so you do not have to resubmit them. Please keep muted unless you're asked to clarify the question or have a follow-up. If I missed your question or if it wasn't answered completely, don't worry. I've asked our panelists to stay a little over and we'll turn on the mics and make sure everyone's questions are answered. Now for our panel on mobilizing your workforce and streamlining costs. First, I'd like to turn the mic over to Tom Collins, the Director of Sales and Marketing at Atlantic Online. Tom? Thank you, my name is Tom Collins, Director of Enterprise Sales and Marketing with Atlantic Online. Uh, Ken, thank you very much for having us on the panel today. Um, also, thank you for doing these sessions on an almost weekly basis since the COVID situation has happened. It's been very helpful for our business and I know that others have been helped as well. What I'm gonna be talking about today is mobilizing your workforce. And Ken, if you could advance the slide, please. Um, on the agenda today is I'm going to talk a little bit about Atlantic Online just to let you all know who are unfamiliar with the company, who we are. I'm going to talk about hosted PBX, also using your mobile phone as your business phone, and then using texting for business as ways to mobilize uh, your workforce. So if you'll advance the slide, please. Atlantic Online is a telephone and internet service provider for business and government. We're based in Silver Spring, Maryland and focus on the Mid-Atlantic region. We focus on delivering internet connectivity and phone services to business and government. We also own and operate two data centers in the region in Silver Spring and Rockville. And we have points of presence in Equinix and Ashburn, Virginia, as well as in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We also deliver enhanced services such as wiring, inside wiring. So if you're building out an office space or moving offices, we can do your LAN cabling, AV cabling, et cetera, for your, your business. Amongst our customers, if you'll advance the slide, please, um, our uh, organizations, what we're most proud of Amazon, uh, and we appreciate Amazon who's moved their HQ2 into the DC area. They have chosen to choose local vendors to deliver services to them. We are amongst those local vendors, and we have over a half dozen circuits with them in their Northern Virginia uh, office footprint. But we have many other clients as well uh, with a primary focus on business, but we can serve government as well. 
Uh, getting into the meat of the presentation here today, if you advance the slide, please. One way to mobilize your workforce is to have a hosted PBX service. Traditionally, the PBX was a, a system that was housed in the office space, and it was kind of a silo in that the phones were connected to a control unit that was in the phone closet. And once you left the friendly environment of the office, you were really unable to access the phone system unless you dialed into it using some codes to check some voicemail, et cetera. Uh, so the premise-based PBX has become a, a, was, became like a silo in which you couldn't operate outside of the office. Having a phone system in the cloud uh, liberate you from the silo. What we mean by the cloud or a hosted PBX is the, the phone system, the PBX is not in your office. It's in a data center or across several data centers. It's in the cloud. It's in the internet. The, the control unit is, is in servers that are uh, in the internet. So primarily what you need to have is internet connectivity to your PBX and you can interact with the phone system no matter where you are. And as you know, since about the middle of March, uh, most of us haven't actually been in the office. We've either been at home or, or elsewhere uh, or working. So if you have internet connectivity where you're working in place from, whether it's wired, you know, a cable plugged into a router, or if you're using Wi-Fi, or even if you're using your cellular connection with this internet connectivity, if you have a hosted PBX, you can interact with your phone system no matter where you are. So that means your customers, your vendors can call you, you can receive a call, you can also make calls, and it's from your work number rather than your home number or your personal cell phone number. Uh, having a hosted PBX also means that you can have freedom with your device. You can turn your desk phone at home into your work phone, or you can have a, a phone, a home phone at home that you turn into your work phone as well. What a lot of people are doing, a lot of people in business are doing is they're using a soft phone. And that's where you have an application that's running on your laptop or desktop computer, and that acts as your telephone or you can even turn your mobile phone into your work phone. And so when you place calls from your mobile phone, it can come from your work number and calls to your work number can be received on your mobile phone. So what this means is you can keep your phone number, keep your, your extension no matter where you are or what device you're using. And you can still enjoy all of the features that you're used to in the office. It's the transferring calls, putting calls on hold, uh, you know, receiving and list and your voicemails, changing your announcements if you want to, uh, of course, making conference calls, and also keeping with the regime within the office of, of any call recording requirements that you may have uh, for your for your telephone call activity for business. So a first step in mobilizing workforce is having a hosted PBX, a PBX in the cloud. If you'll advance the slide, please. Uh, an exciting service that we're delivering now is we can actually turn your mobile phone into uh, an endpoint. So having a desk phone in your office, having desk phones, these costs can add up over time. Everyone is always uh, carrying their cell phone with them, their mobile phone. You can't take your desk phone with you, but you always have your mobile phone with you, at least I do. Um, so the idea about using the mobile phone as your endpoint is that you have, you only need one phone. You don't need to have a separate phone that's sitting on your desk, whether it's in the office or at home where you're working from now. You can use your mobile phone and you don't need to have a separate personal mobile phone and a, and a separate work phone. That one mobile device can be both your work and your personal phone and you don't need to run an application on the on your on your mobile phone to make phone calls from your work number or receive phone calls from your work number you can do it right from the native dialer of the phone of your mobile phone so whether uh uh, so you're, you have a consistent interaction with your telephone calling experience, whether it's your personal calls that you're making or it's your work calls. But what we do at, at Atlantic Online is we put a SIM into your mobile phone. So, so you have your SIM for your, your personal cell phone carrier. You also have a SIM for your work 
smartphone, turning this one device into both your work and your personal phone. And this enables you uh, and also the business owner to monitor calls for compliance, retention, and quality assurance um, uh, uh, purposes. Um, and, and phone calls that are, that are made to customers aren't, aren't lost from your call detail records because they're made from their personal cell phone. Even though you're using their personal phone, the hardware, the business, the, the SIM that we ins install on the phone enables you to make and receive calls at your, person, at your work number, which enables it to operate within the compliance, call retention, and quality assurances that the business has in place. This also helps ensure uh, endpoint detection and response, which is called EDR, and device security. Brian Vaughn, who's going to speak after me, is going to talk a little bit more about those issues and the implications of them. And by the way, um, we, the presenters after me are both excellent presenters. Both Brian and Mark Friedman have really good information. And the gentleman from the SBA has a lot of good information about um, uh, things that, programs that are available for business in today's environment. If we go to the next slide, please, and this is my last um, the last thing that I'll be talking about uh, for mobilizing your workforce is um, using texting in business. You know, texting isn't just for young people anymore. Uh, I text a lot for business and, and, tr and uh, until recently when I was texting for business, I was using my personal cell phone number, which isn't good necessarily for a business owner. They want to be able to retain records for their business purposes. Um, so it, with Atlantic Online, we have a service where you can uh, use your DID, your direct inward dial, your business phone number as your text number. In fact, I encourage you uh, to text me at my, my, uh, my business number, which is right here on the screen, 301 755 2232, that's my DID at my desk phone for the office uh, at work. Send a text to me and I can text you back. And the, the, the thing about this is that the texting is taking place within the confines of the business phone system so that uh, for a business you can keep records of the texting but also and this is a key thing people might be texting you right now and you don't even know it. We turned on this service for a customer recently as a pilot. We turned on uh, texting their main phone number, turned it on as a pilot, and in the first week they had received four dozen texts. They, they didn't announce that they were turning this on. People were texting them already and they were missing the num these, these texts. Because think about it, a lot of, especially younger people in the workforce, this is their primary uh, way of interacting of communicating is text. They see a phone number, they try to text it. You might be missing text right now and you don't even know it. And the, some of the uh, benefits of, of texting is that an immediate response is possible. Of course, you can, tech, you can track text if you're doing it in this environment, texting in business, using it with your, your phone system, your hosted PBX system. It can also be a very powerful promotional tool that has automated responses. You can have chatbots, as it were, that were, were texting back to you. By the way, I'm receiving some texts right now. I can hear them coming in and I'll, I'll reply to them here uh, as, as I'm wrapping up. Um, in fact, texting in business uh, has become so prominent as of late that here you can see there's a Wall Street Journal article from April 30th, just last week, texting customers is no longer taboo when everyone is stuck at home. So uh, this is a way that you can mobilize your, work, your workers too, your workforce, is to use texting in business. Now I could talk for hours about how you can mobilize your business, uh, mobilize your workers, uh, uh, using telecommunications. I don't have that much time, um, but if you uh, please stay on the, on the call, I can answer some questions that you may have. And I definitely think you should listen to what Brian Mark had to say and Mr. Johnson from the SBA. Uh, so that's my presentation. Ken, back to you. Okay, thank you, Tom. And I'm just going to take a second to, uh, um, 
uh, pitch our, I think I skipped this, sorry, Sk uh, our next week's event on 513, same time, same channel, uh, while not the same Zoom info, the password might change, so look out for that. We're going to be talking about the management of a virtual workforce and sales team next week. Uh, the actual management and HR, uh, and of course, we'll have our favorite loan officer, Rod Johnson, to continue to make sure the questions about SBA programs are answered. So ne next up is, uh, um, will be Brian Vaughn from ShipShape IT. Unlimited, limited, uncluttered, uncomplicated, you, you, you. So Brian's gonna talk about the cybersecurity aspects of a mobile workforce. Brian, go ahead. Thank you, Ken. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, two, two primers before I get into some of the uh, content here for you. Um, one is um, IT, just like accounting, public relations, marketing, Salesforce development is not an event, it's a process. So I'd encourage you as we run through these things, please don't get in the mindset is if I just flip this switch, I'm cyber secure. Um, I'd encourage you to take a holistic, comprehensive approach, just like you do with areas of law, accounting, PR, et cetera. Uh, so with that, um, uh, what we're shooting for here is um, hard dollar cost benefits. That's the case both with uh, what Tom gave you um, about integrating internet connectivity, voice lines, applications, voice traffic, data traffic. The idea is to provide a cost benefit there uh, as well as a hard dollar cost benefit. I think IT often makes the mistake of speaking in generalities about cost benefit. And the idea is that that's more uh, worker efficiency, uh, not hard dollars. And what we're gonna talk about today in addition to Tom's presentation is hard dollar cost benefits, uh, which is a perfect lead in I think for Mark's uh, portion there. So with that, let's get right to it. Item one we have on there, we'll call it a task list uh, for security hygiene and risk mitigation for small businesses. There's a couple of these I'm gonna put a gold star next to. Um, Ken, is there any way that we can expand that? It seems a lot, lot smaller than typical. Um, not sure if people are gonna be able to read that font size. Um, fortunately, I've got it on a printout, so I can. So uh, real quick, centralized managed antivirus uh, any malware solutions. The key there is centralized and managed. I think everybody knows what antivirus software is. The notion I want to share with you today is you need to have uh, a, a view into that. So when somebody has their travel laptop sitting in a desk and not updating virus definitions, there's a way that your MSP can see that. The idea of what we're looking at with the centralized managed AV solution is a button that an executive manager can click and see who's updating the virus definitions and who's not. Uh, we talk about uh, vectors for attack, uh, um, email coming in to a desktop that is not protected is often chief among them. Um, number two, having a formal documented and enforced storage and retention plan. Um, there we are. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I could spend 10 minutes on that item alone, having a formal documented and enforced storage and retention plan. What I would share with you as a quick primer here is have a plan. Know where your data is stored. Uh, we see it all the time where a senior executive is just saving to my documents on their home PC and not saving that to locally. So you either need to put a desktop backup agent on that executive's desktop or you need to have uh, my, my, my documents configured to be saving on some place that is backed up. Uh, number three, and forgive me for moving quickly here. I got, got five or six minutes to get through all the content and I'm timing myself. Um, implement a formal out-of-band request for confirmation requirement for check requests and ACHs. Uh, this is a gold star one. If you're going to take one thing away from my chat today, implement this. Do not enable a policy where accounts payable staff or anyone in your accounting department can pay monies based on a single type of communication. Uh, we see, again, email is the most common attack vector for people looking to uh, um, exploit uh, either money or uh, intellectual property. Uh, we see it all the time where someone sends a controller an email and then that email uh, results in a wire transfer happening. Out of band confirmations, anytime a request for a check comes in, certainly to a new entity or to a new banking location, that has to be a text and or a verbal confirmation. So we'd encourage you uh, to talk about a formal process by what that's implemented and then documented, which we'll chat again on number eight real quickly. Uh, but the key is separate confirmations other than email when check requests or ACHs are getting made. 
Um, number five, implementing external message uh, warning notifications on your email server. This is a cost you nothing, high value, low hanging fruit fix. Whether it's Office 365, App River, Premise Hosted Exchange, uh, whatever your mail system is, all mail systems have a capability that when any message is received from outside that domain, to have a message header. Some of you probably see these on other people's emails where the actual uh, email comes in and the first thing you read is, is attention external sender. And the idea is there that it stops people from being able to fake an internal email and then being able to do check requests or other methods of extracting IP. Again, this is something your MSP can implement with very little effort and no cost, and it's a very high value, low, low hanging fruit item. Gold star items is number four for the out of band verification and implementing external email notification features. Um, if I'm gonna have a gold star for a third one, it would be number six, which is implementing multi-factor authentication for email and or desktop access. Um, this is often referred to as two-factor authentication, which is kind of a simpler version of it. And we won't bore you with the details of what makes multi-factor authentication uh, different than two-factor authentication. But the theory is, is there some other uh, verification besides your username and password? something you know and something you have. Uh, what we additionally recommend is something on your mail system uh, that is configured to talk to your phone. Microsoft has a free product called Microsoft Authenticator, which is probably the easiest, uh, least complicated and least expensive solution to implement. So the theory is when you access your email, either on your desktop or, or on your phone, and you log into that mail system, you actually get an SMS certification and you type in that that number that you get into your mail system in order to make sure that you have secure access. And if someone steals your password, they still can't get access to your mail system because you don't have the separate authentication. All right, number seven. Um, this is more for organizations that have a uh, greater risk of IP getting stolen, um, have some type of compliance requirements. Uh, the term that you'll hear bannered about quite a bit is data loss prevention, DLP. Um, there's ways to implement this within just your mail system. So the theory is if someone's taking uh, a list of social security numbers or credit card numbers, you can configure your mail system in your local network to be able to detect that and be able to stop that email from going out or stop that um, you know, jump drive download from actually happening or you need to actually have a manager give permission to be able to send that. So again, it's a lot of detail, probably more technical sale and I won't bother you with how to cover that from jump, but it is something you wanna to talk to your MSP about if you have high regulatory requirements or you have very sensitive IP that you're worried about uh, managers taking, stealing, or other people in your company starting up their own business and taking your IP. Uh, last and final item, which is probably uh, weaving in, probably the most important of all these and weaving into how I opened this presentation today, which is process, process, process. You go ahead and you establish a method for two-factor authentication or out-of-band verification for check requests, and you don't formalize it, you don't document it, you don't train on it, you don't move it into your handbooks, it might as well not even happen. Not even happen, excuse me. So as you think about implementing these plans, implement them within your documentation, implement them within your new hire onboarding process and your offboarding process. We see all the times when we take over new accounts that there's users from five years ago that no longer work for the organization, but you never terminated their mail access or their Office 365 access or some other file-based access. So that, that's basically the quick and dirty. Uh, if I could ask you to go to the next slide for me, Ken, as we wrap up, please. Um, comprehensive white glove approach. Uh, the theory is the items that you see here around the circle, we need a comprehensive solution in order to have comprehensive security. If you secure your mail system, but you're not your servers and not your uh, password strength, you only have 50% of the solution. Uh, last and final slide for me, if you would, please, Ken. Um, feel free to contact uh, our sales director, Dan Blatt, or myself, if any of these things seem um, interesting. These are things we can coach you through on the phone without charge, how to coordinate with your uh, mail host or your MSP in order to get these things implemented. But they are things that cost almost nothing and take very little process and, uh, and management time, and we certainly recommend you implement them. Thank you, everybody. Off next to uh, Mark Friedman, who is gonna talk about more hard dollar cost benefits and I think probably, more, objectively speaking, even more so than, than Tom and myself. Uh, so with that, I'll hand off to Mark and, and wish you all the best. Okay, thanks. Let me just uh, pause for a second to swap out decks here. Ask for everyone's indulgence. Well, there, there you go, Mark. Expense, expense to profit. Great, thanks, Ken, I appreciate it. Um, our main goal in life 
is finding solutions for businesses and teaching them how to put that cash back into their business so they can use it to either uh, expand their business, creating additional sales, or maybe there's just not enough profit for the owners of the business. Next, please. Aberdeen Group put out a report recently that said that most businesses are missing out on $150 billion worth of expenses that they're being overcharged for. And main reasons are they first don't know the true cost, and the second is they don't understand pricing benchmarks. When I say they don't know the true, true cost, one of our clients was on a cost plus 15% model. When we re reviewed what they were spending on supplies, we found that they were overpaying by 18%. My next question to the CFO was, are you now cost minus 3%? So the key is to understand what truly goes into costs. Next. We're able to um, go to our clients and, and look at their vendors 87% of the time to get them equal or better service levels, equal or better product quality, and save them 10 to 40% on their expenses without making a change with the existing vendors. Next. So there's uh, different expense reduction opportunities. I'm gonna address four of them real quick today that I call quick wins. And hopefully you'll be able to um, pull away something that will be able to give you some ideas where you can yourself implement something today, tomorrow, the next day, be able to help uh, you survive through this, uh, through the C19 is what we call it because it's a lot easier uh, element that we're in today. Next. So the first thing you have to do is have a conversation with your vendors. Don't be shy. If you owe them money, they want to talk to you. They not, may not be reaching out because they realize that everybody has different pain points, but the key is you need to set up a call. First of all, you need to talk to your contact, and I strongly recommend that it's a joint call between the decision maker or owner of the business because they'll typically have the excuse when you try to get some kind of a uh, a, a change in how you pay that vendor, they're gonna say, well, I gotta ask and whoever it is. So if you get that owner and decision maker on the phone at the same time, that excuse goes away. Second of all, I recommend as opposed to you proposing something to them, I would ask them if they have a solution they can recommend. They know your business, they know how you normally pay, they should be able to, to find something that they feel um, works for them as well. And the bottom line is if you're normally on a 30-day pay window, you're looking for it to be extended. And if they say, well, what would you like? I always say ask for the most because you can't go up, you can only come down. So I typically say if you're normally on 30 days, ask for 90 days right now. Typically you'll settle on, 60, on a 60-day window. That's probably helpful for everybody. And then the other thing is a lot of people have not been paying their landlords. That is a really serious violation of your lease and can be very detrimental to your business because they could actually put a lien on your business. You don't want to lean on your business. So my suggestion is once again, have the same conversations we just discussed, typically with your leasing agent and somebody that's in, in control of how that building, the building you're in is managed. Most landlords are willing to take your unpaid months and put them at the end of the lease. Reason being is at the end of the lease, you're paying your highest rate rent. It's advantageous to them. Do they need the cash flow today? Of course they do. They got to pay the mortgage on the building. That said, that seems to be what we find to be the most attractive for most landlords. The other thing that you can do if your lease is kind of very short term is renegotiate your current lease, ask for a few months of deferred rent. Once again, instead of your lease, new lease being five years or Maybe you have six months left, so they'll add that six months on. Um, instead of it being a five years now, five years, six months, or five year, eight months, or six years, or whatever that lease term can be added to, you can renegotiate your current lease and get yourself a little bit less burden, of course, unless you have the PPP, then 25% of the money that you got for the PPP loan but can be used to pay that lease rent payment. Next slide, please. So here's a quick win. We call it the accounts payable audit. Um, you want to look for duplicate erroneous payments, missed discounts, pricing errors, rebates, and returns that you made that have not been credited. 
You have to have somebody look at these on an ongoing basis, but at least right now, you should give a little bit extra, extra attention. That's typically where we find a lot of results. Next slide. Your print management contract. Everybody's got usually a printer in their office. We find a lot of savings here. Whoever runs your IT, <coughs> excuse me, have them look at everybody's settings. Your computer print defaults should be black and white. Why? Because most websites have something that's in color and it's usually the website address if that's not blocked out. That little print of color, whether it's page two or that, that address, considered is, is a color print. And color prints are typically three times more costly than a black print, if not more, depending on the service that you have. So we recommend that you make sure that all defaults are set to black and white, unless somebody prints a lot of color all the time, then you don't change their default. But everybody else should be on black and white. Next slide. Another quick win is with telecom, wireless, wire, and data. Um, as Tom mentioned, there's a lot of things you can look at now to combine to get rid of um, desk phones, which now um, will reduce your costs. But do you have the correct plan on your wireless accounts? Uh, we see many times when we look at wireless accounts, we can save 25 to 30 percent just by restructuring the account without changing your vendor. So the key is to look at your, your invoices, make sure that you're not missing any discounts again. What are the services that you're paying for? Do you need all the services? I even had one on my own account the other day that I got rid of. I was paying for extra um, uh, uh, hotspot on my wireless phone. Well, I think that was $10 a month. Well, $10 a month is not a lot, but when you have multiple people having the same service, you know, $10 a month times 25 or 50 people is all of a sudden 250 or $500 a month, which is $6,000 a year. Get rid of it if you don't need it. Only turn it on for people who actually need the service. And then in cloud services, if you're using Amazon or Azure or Google service, there's, a, there, there's services out there that actually can turn on and turn off your services. You need it saving you 40 to 50 to 60% and your costs on an ongoing basis for, for Amazon. We had a client who actually had negotiated with Amazon rates. Amazon never changed the rates. They've been using the service for five years. They were a startup. Now they're obviously using quite a bit more services than they were using before. And we were able to reduce their bills by 60% because they just were not on the right rate plan. So sometimes you have to look at what you're currently using. Next slide. Those are all quick wins. Here's a big one. Do you have any unclaimed property or funds sitting in your state treasury? Every person should not only check their own name, but they should check their business name. And you don't have to be very specific. Don't put the whole business name in. Just basically put one or two parts of a business name and do a search. So if you go to unclaimed.org, it'll take you directly to the state. So if you might have claims in Virginia, if you were in Virginia one time, you may have claims in Maryland, if you were in Maryland or DC or wherever you're located, but you may want to check multiple websites. And all you do is you put your name in, business name, personal name, see if there's a check out there that got sent to the treasurer of the state where the business or the person was located at the time. That is huge. There's $3 billion being returned annually and one in 10 people have money sitting at these treasures. So we always recommend you go there. Could be some found money that you didn't know you had. Next slide. This is the result of what we do. We basically increase your profits, we reduce your costs. Costs. It takes four to 12 weeks if you're working with us and we do it on a risk-free basis where we don't charge you unless we find savings. If we do find savings, then we share in the savings together. Next slide. I want to thank everybody for paying attention. That's how you can get in touch with me or, um, or directly set a time for us to speak. I'm happy to answer any questions um, as we move into the later part. Thank you, Mark. And you know, Mark, I was on your website recently and I don't know what it is, but I just really think your website's well done. Mm. And that blog that shot you out to number one in Google, also really, Really good job there. Thanks, Ken. You and your team are doing a great job for us. Um, you created a great website, new website for us. And the SEO work that you guys are doing, I used to be on the third or fourth page. It only took about nine months where I'm now on the first page if you do um, search a couple of terms. So thanks. Appreciate it. No problem. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. And so now, uh, just for those who've joined, we've had a lot of people join, uh, join recently. 
I uh, just want to remind you next week we'll be working on the management of a, of a remote workforce. So if you know anyone that that would apply to, please spread the word. Uh, there was a reminder in this morning's email with the Zoom info. Please go ahead and register. You know, we, we depend on our audience to help us spread the word and, get, and let people know about the content we provide here. So without, um, so before we go into the um, S, uh, SBA, I just want to uh, talk with our panel. We kind of, the SBA is kind of the, its own segment. So we're gonna turn the rest of the time over to Rod. Um, and I just wanna spend five minutes asking our panel some questions from the audience. We haven't got a lot of audience uh, questions, questions um, today, but we do have some from the registration. So one is people would like to know more about virtual collabor collaboration companies use. For instance, one um, attendee uses Teams, uh, others of course use Google, and then you mix and match a lot of other things with it. And then of course you have Zoom, <coughs> which takes a part of what Teams does, and there's a lot of overlap and mix. How does one go about choosing a, a good uh, tool there? Well, so uh, I think I'll field that initially. Again, Tom Collins, Director of Enterprise Sales and Marketing at Atlantic Online. Um, I think a, a good place to start is what platform are you using now for your office applications. Obviously, if you're using the Google Docs, the, the G Suite uh, for your business, then uh, using the Google platform for meeting, Google Meetings is a good place to start. If you're in Office 365, which is now called Microsoft 365, certainly Teams would be a good choice to, uh, to use for this collaboration. Uh, Atlantic Online uses Teams. We think it's an excellent, um, uh, an, an excellent program, excellent for collaboration. In addition to that, uh, Teams can be used as a soft phone with our telephone service. Uh, Zoom is, is, is a very popular uh, collaboration tool as well. Uh, and it does have the ability to work on all different operating systems. If you're using an iOS device, a Droid device, if you're on Windows, if you're on Mac. Um, it's, it's agnostic on, on the platform, which makes that a very good choice. But, but also uh, Cisco has the WebEx platform, uh, and that's very good, especially for larger enterprises, but it has an application for SMB as well. So that's, what, that's how I would answer that question initially. And, and Brian, could you, could you put in your two cents and also mention the security side of it? Because a lot of people have concerns about security with Zoom, for instance? Absolutely. I, I think uh, two technologies off the top that you see very uh, uh, very often when people have this discussion is, is Proofpoint and Mimecast. Um, both of those are mail continuity and security solutions that organizations will implement. Uh, works in tandem with Office 365, your local host, hosted exchange, and gives you options around um, uh, TFA as well as data loss prevention. Um, we've had good success uh, on the um, on the uh, kind of the screen share app side with with Teams. Uh, Join me and Zoom are the three that we see out there the most. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm more concerned with the desktop getting compromised uh, than I am with the Zoom implementation being compromised. So what I would say is, if you can start off uh, with strong desktop security, uh, Zoom will more than likely follow as will join me or, or other applications. I haven't heard instances of people hacking uh, into these uh, um, shared application resources uh, instead of hacking into the individual desktops or the uh, infrastructure of that corporation, which is probably where I concentrate my effort. Okay, thanks. And, and Mark, these things add up. So how do you, you know, I, I vir virtual phones, uh, you know, Zoom, Teams or Google, et cetera. How do you kind of mix and match in a way which you don't end up spending, you know, too, uh, way too much on these things? Yeah, so um, Teams has recently evolved in the last six months as a big player now. If you are already paying for a subscription to Office 365 <coughs> or Microsoft 365, no matter what your subscription is, it comes with Teams. It comes with all these services. You no longer have to pay for an add-on. 
So Zoom is a service, while it's not very expensive, it is an add-on. And oh, by the way, they recently about, I think two or three weeks ago, actually updated all the security features in Zoom and defaulted everybody to the most secure. So you have to reset your security features if you don't want to be that secure anymore. So the Zoom bombing that was going on has now pretty much gone away. Um, but as Brian said, it's practices, you know, it's, it's all, it all starts at the desktop and protection internally. Um, and, you know, when you add everything up, it just depends whether or not you're more comfortable with different services. Sometimes you pay a little bit more to have a different service so it's not integrated. Um, other times it's better for it to be integrated if you have more people on a service. Um, and then the solution that Tom suggested with Teams um, being able to also, also serve as a soft, soft phone, you're getting a lot of information that, um, about these calls from a compliance standpoint that you didn't have before, and it's automatically integrated um, into solutions. So that's also very helpful as well. So there's a lot of things that are out there. If you need things that are more secure, like the government, I think only uses some um, Cisco solution, the WebEx solution. So it just depends on who you're with and what you're doing and what your needs and requirements are. Um, but once again, as everything else, just because it says it costs this much doesn't mean it costs that much. A lot of times you can have a conversation uh, depending what your need are and work with the provider to make sure, make sure you're, you're actually being charged the right prices. Something tells me conversations with you go differently than conversations with me when I talk to people about how much they're charging. Um, the, uh, cause I, you know, they, they never offer me anything. Um, the biggest, the biggest thing Ken is, is you just have to know what things cost. We've got mm -hmm. a lot of lists in different expense categories about what things should cost. So that's, that's more what it is. It's having that knowledge that is extremely helpful. Okay. And the, another question from the audience is, are there internet plans that companies can get in bulk for remote employees? That's a good question. Can you defer some of the costs for your employees and get some, you know, provide them internet cheaper than they can provide it when you patch it up? I think, Tom, that'd be probably for you, but Brian and Mark, if you know the answer, please jump in. Well, well I'll pipe in initially. So if we're, are we talking about internet connectivity for end users, like your workers? Yes. That, that's yeah. a question, but you know, I guess the phone, you know, the phone thing might apply too. Of course, you know, we, we'll kind of address that separately, but yeah, go ahead, mm -hmm. internet. So internet connectivity, um, most, most of your choices at home are gonna be between a Verizon or Comcast uh, service, you know, the local telephone company, the local cable company who compete for uh, consumer business. Uh, and they might, uh, those companies might uh, deliver a discount if you're signing up multiple workers under your, your work account. For, for telephone service, certainly the hosted PBX service um, provides an economy of scale because your workers can be using the, the service, whether they're at the office or at home, or even on travel as well. And like I alluded to earlier, you can also bundle in uh, cell cellular phone where the mobile phone becomes the endpoint for your worker. They can have a, a cellular plan that's part of your hosted PBX service. And this does have an economy of scale, saving the, money, uh, the business some money. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Mark, uh, Brian, you have anything to chime in there? So the only thing that I would say is what you've seen, like a lot of people, a lot of business today with people bringing their own device or BYOD, um, give employees a $50, typically a $50 monthly stipend to bring your own device as opposed to for, for mobile service. So the same thing goes now with work at home. We're seeing a lot of businesses giving the employee $50 stipend to upgrade from the lower level um, Comcast or, or Fios network services and then bringing them up to another level that's typically higher that makes it easier and um, uh, uh, the connection becomes a lot more um, uh, stronger for everybody. So, I mean, the, the, the cost, most people, if they're on the lower end services, you add another $50 a month to your service cost to the higher levels. And oh, by the way, right now, a lot of the providers are allowing you to upgrade um, for lower fees. There's a lot of really good plans going on right now. So you should look at that. So if you're working at home, 
you know, call your local provider, whoever that is, whether it's Cox or Comcast or Verizon, <clears throat> and and let them upload. You know, right now it's like thirty, forty dollars, and you can get gigabit speeds. So, and then ask your 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 um, employee, your employer, to hey, look, I had an upgrade, so we have better connectivity. Can you help me out? And most employers think, sure. You know, we'll give you that thirty or Mark, Mark, this is for the employers, not the employees. Yeah, but you know, sometimes you got to help out. We're all in this together, right? That's right. Um, if I could just chime in there on uh, sure. on the EYOD sure. factor, if I may, I, I I agree with just about everything that Mark and Tom said. Uh, I'll, I'll be the sole uh, naysayer uh, and voice around BYOD uh, in general. Um, think about the issue where your employee works from home, punches a hole in your VPN to log into your premise uh, uh, infrastructure, but they don't have virus protection on their home desktop. Can you mandate that they use your virus protection and protect their desktop? And the answer is no. You can policy this, you can uh, HR this, but the reality is, is you can't go tell your employees what you're gonna do with their home equipment. And I believe that's the case with phones. I believe that's the case with desktops. You can't back up their desktop where they have pictures that they don't want you backing up. Uh, and you get into a quagmire of who owns what. What we would generally say is furnish your, uh, your employees. If, if money's an issue, get a used Dell laptop. You can do it for 400 bucks now. Uh, just make sure you get the uh, professional edition of the Windows operating system so you connect to your home domain. Uh, and make sure you don't run into these issues where your employee says, I'm not going to do A, B, or C because it's my equipment. Own your own equipment, and that way you can kind of govern it. Otherwise, you're, you're left in the in the uh, wild, wild west when it comes to being able to protect your home employee's desktop and not carry liability if something goes south while they're working on your infrastructure. And since you brought that up, I want to invite Lane Hornbeck <laughs> from Schulman and Rogers to see if she has any comments because she's kind enough to let us use her Zoom because she has this enterprise 500 max Zoom she's letting us use. So Lane, do you have any comment on the legal aspects of what you can and can't require? Your employees to do? Yes, thank you. If you saw me going apoplectic as kind of legal advice was being I, I offered. I just my mind. I knew it was, was happening. You can have a policy with a BYOD um, arrangement that the employee agrees if they use their own device on the network that the network has access to all data on that device. So you really want to have a written policy in advance before you do that. Um, but the reality is if they're on your network, you have access to everything that's in on their device, depending upon how I guess sophisticated your system is. You can require it, you just need to make sure it's in writing and that they've signed it. That's my two yeah. cents. Yeah, thanks, Lane. Uh, for, for me, I, I think it's providing the device long-term is, is much cheaper and, and it also provides a sense of what's work and what's not, in my opinion. And I think that's something we'll talk about next week. If you, have, if you missed that plug, please register for next week. We'll talk about management of remote employees. Um, another question, What's a good cloud-based solution for small law firms? So this not very specific about internet connectivity or uh, Teams or whatever. Some of that was covered. I don't want to recover the same things we covered. Any advice from any of our panelists to add about uh, what would be a good IT slash cloud solution for a law firm? How would they go about shopping for that? I could handle that one. Uh, I, I would say from a uh, file of print and mail system perspective, Office 365 is, is the 800 pound gorilla that I think most people feel comfortable with. Um, when it comes to uh, case management, docketing, conflict checking software, what we'll call legal specific application management, uh, there's a uh, software as a service vendor called Clio, uh, which is very, uh, very, very popular, CLIO. Uh, it's a web-based uh, kind of all-in-one law firm management, time tracking, case docketing, calendar, and conflict checking software. Uh, very inexpensive. It's one of those ones where they have single-user packages and three-user packages. Uh, so for firms that are just starting out or people that are breaking out of a larger firm and just starting their own, uh, we found that a very affordable, um, uh, quick and easy uh, get. So Office 365 in concert with Clio is what we've seen as probably the most effective cost beneficial solution for small firms. Okay, and I have uh, one more question. I haven't seen a lot of questions from the audience today. We've gone through, I think all the ones um, that we've gotten, we will have a chance for open mic at the end of this that includes this panel. But so if you have any questions, please text now. I have a question going back to this cell phone which, with two SIM cards. I did not know that. I consider myself reasonably <clears throat> technical 
technically astute, but I did not know you could put two <coughs> SIM cards in a single cell phone. Tom, is there any restrictions on uh, what type of phone? Of course, Apple versus Android and or carrier, because I, I thought that some carriers don't use SIM cards, some do. And is there a limitation on this uh, with regard to like what, what's the minimum number of employees before considering this that you put onto that? And then also, does this mean that it, you can have transfer capability and the other things on that second number that goes to a cell phone and is handled you know, in a routing, some sort of PBX type way as well? Uh, well, yes is the answer in that, that, uh, that this, is, this is something that works on newer model phones. If you have like an iPhone 7, it doesn't have this kind of capability. But on the newer model phones, the 10s, the XRs, uh, the iPhone 11, also on your newer Droid uh, phone models, Samsung uh, Notes 9, uh, et cetera, uh, you can have multiple SIMs. In fact, I think you can have on some models up to eight SIMs. And when I'm talking about SIMs, I'm also talking about what's called an eSIM. Uh, it's uh, you know it's like a virtual SIM. And then what happens on your on your phone? And uh, I'm going to show show you here. Is uh, I don't know if you guys can see if I'm showing this. Uh, if you all can see my phone, but you can use the native dialer. You would be able to. Um, when you're making a call, you dial the number. When you're pushing your button, you have the, uh, the, the green button to make the call. You're, you're presented with an option. Are you gonna use your, your, your personal cell phone or are you gonna use your work cell phone, your, your eSIM uh, uh, part of the phone? And then uh, addressing your question about we'd be able to transfer absolutely with the native interface of the phone, you'll be able to do the three-way calling where you conference in other people, bring people on a hold. You'll also be able to, to transfer calls. And I think this is very important. You would be able to transfer calls to other people in your organization using their four or five digit extension and, and having them ring on directly on their desk phone if that's what they're using or on their version of the uh, Atlantic wireless service. Um, so it's a very innovative service that Atlantic Online is offering and um, like to talk some more about it. Uh, but again, uh, we, we have limited time here and I hope that addresses your questions. A minimal number of employees to consider something like that? The, no is the answer. Okay, it, if, if you have one person, two people, if you have 100 or 200, uh, I'd be happy to, uh, uh, to assist. Okay, well, I think I might have to ask you to send me the quote on that because I'm not sure my, my employees are listening. That next question will be from them. Why do I have to use my own phone when I'm working from home? So that, that's why I love these sessions. It's good business for everybody. Um, uh, now I'm going to put you on the spot, Tom. I'm going to be mean and I'm going to invite others to answer this question. So you're host of PBX and such, but what about the others? You have Ring Central, you have um, Dialpad and such. Eight by eight. So you know, let's be fair and, you know, what are pluses and minuses that a business might consider in cho choosing among all the options? Well, I, think, I think Ring Central, 8 by 8 dial pad as well, uh, all competitors of ours and also deliver a very good service. Uh, Ring Central in the past year has aligned itself with Avaya. And for those who have an Avaya PBX transitioning to Ring Central is a lot easier for them because they've kind of banded together uh, with that kind of business model in mind. Um, of course, we think a, a good idea about use a good reason to use Atlantic Online is because hosted PBX isn't the only service that we deliver. We can also do the internet connectivity that's required. We own and operate two data centers and can house your uh, servers or your or or your cloud in our data centers. We can also do things like uh, inside wiring if you're expanding your office or building out your office. So it's a total telecom solution uh, for your business. But I do think companies like uh, Ring Central, Eight by Eight, Dialpad, these are all excellent alternatives 
Uh, and um, another thing I should add is with our service, you can use Microsoft Teams as your soft phone. So if you have a, a Microsoft 365, you're using Teams and you want to be able to use that as your soft phone for making calls that will interact with our hosted PBX platform uh, and help you reduce uh, costs as well. Uh, because you're leveraging your Microsoft 365 investment, you're not having to to buy a, a desk a desk phone or uh, pay for a license for a soft phone. You've already got it with Microsoft Teams. Okay. And last word from Mark O'Brien. I don't have really anything of uh, of, of great great substance to to add there. I think Tom did a great job with it. I got a, got a, uh, a qu uh, comment. We're way past five minutes for the, the questions. It's actually five minutes for the presentation. Questions were about, about on time. So next, without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Rod. Um, Johnson, I'm sorry, Mark, did you have anything to say? Nope, we're good. Okay, great. We're, I'll turn it over to Rod Johnson with the SBA. Rod? All right, and, thank and Rod, you, Ken. Way, I noticed that you are a certified fitness trainer in, in, in addition to having a financial and banking past. So you keep us fiscally and physically fit. Is that right? <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. So anytime there. it's important to be fiscally fit. All right. Absolutely. So we're going to discuss in five short minutes financial tools and resources to help small businesses and nonprofit organizations during these trying times coping with COVID-19. Next slide, please. So we're going to cover five quick items. All of them are actually, well, th four of the five are actually under the CARES Act with the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, better known as EIDL, actually being administered by the SBA itself. The other four are actually a collaboration between the Treasury Department and the SBA. And when you think about it, this is the first collaboration that the Treasury and SBA have had in the SBA's history dating back to 1953. So we're going to talk about the SBA, Delief, SBA Debt Relief Program. And actually, this program gets very little press at all. And I think it's a good tool for small businesses and nonprofits to have. We're going to talk about how to augment cash flow. We're going to discuss the SBA Express Bridge Loan Program, which, like Lazarus, has been resurrected from the dead. Um, that program has been dead for 15 years, and now we've brought it back under the CARES Act. Next slide, please. So the, we're going to talk about the Small Business Debt Relief Program. I think this is fantastic. So this program pro provides immediate relief to small businesses with non-disaster back SBA loans, including the 7A504 and micro loans. This is something that has never happened in the history of the SBA. And that is for the first six months, if you have one of the three loans mentioned above, the SBA will cover all loan payments, including principal, interest, and fees for six months up through September 27th, 2020. Once again, if you apply for a non-disaster relief, 7A, 504, or microloan, the SBA on your behalf as the borrower will pay the first six months of principal and interest and fees associated with that loan. That's huge. Next slide, please. All right, so using loan payment deferrals to augment cash flow. So for non-SBA business loans, this is what had to happen. The Treasury Department and the SBA went out to the OCC and the FDIC and state regulators to tell the banks, look, we need you guys, when the borrowers approach you for loan deferrals, better known in the banking industry as loan modifications, we need you guys to go ahead and process those deferrals up to six months. Now, the way that the borrower accesses these deferrals is you go and have a conversation with your bank and say that you want 
a loan deferral for six months. Typically, banks don't like to do de um, loan deferrals because it generally has a negative impact on their standings with their regulatory agencies. But because of these trying times that we're in and we want to help small businesses, the again, the OCC and the FDIC issued you know, a joint letter to uh, these financial institutions to go ahead and process these deferrals. Next slide, please. The PPP program. This is the one that's getting all of the press, okay? So before we go into that program, let me just give you some highlights. As of yesterday at 5 p.m., there were 2,378,057 approved loans. The amount of those approved loans were 181 billion, 158,000, excuse me, dollars And remember this program was funded with $310 billion. So the, the streets of America are being paved with greenbacks to help um, small businesses um, sustain themselves. Now, the PPP program, you had it up there for me, Ken, I guess we lost it. But as you know, under the PPP program, I'll keep talking. <laughs> okay. So uh, I under get it so the fonts were the right size. Ah, see, I wish we could be out on the beach. All right, so while okay. Ken is finding that, under the PPP right. program, we do know that it's up to, okay, well, there you go, okay. Well, on yeah. the next slide on PPP? Uh, or this you know what, go ahead to the next slide. Okay. Go ahead to the next slide, yep, all right. So under the PPP program, we know the small businesses and nonprofits, including religious organizations and tribal concerns are actually eligible for this program. Now, if the applicant is a business, the concern must have fewer than 500 employees or be within the SBA size standards. Now, you need to go to www.sba.gov size standard. Now, I'm going to pause there for a minute. There's been all this controversy around Shake Shack and Ruth Chris and Pot Bellies and some of these other organizations where people feel as though they were not entitled to the money. Well, actually, let me make a distinction right here. First of all, people need to understand that there are size standards based on one's NAICS codes, okay? So based on the SBA's definition of a small business, those organizations that I just named actually fall within the size standards of the SBA, okay, as a small business. Now, there's a difference between the small business and what most people think of as micro businesses. And let me define what I mean by a micro business. So micro businesses, I define it, is the sole proprietorship, the single member LLC, or the 1099 miscellaneous, um, if you will, worker. So those are micro businesses. Let's not get those confused with the definition of small business under the SBA, okay? Now, under this program, as we know, the loan amount can be up to 10 million, reflecting 2.5 times the firm's average monthly payroll, the interest rate is 1%. The loan forgiveness comes into play if 75% or more of the loan amount is used to cover payroll expenses and staff levels are maintained. There are no loan fees. I'll stop here a minute. Um, two days ago, um, in the question and answer period, a firm told me they paid a management consulting firm $8,500 to assist them in applying for the PPP. Let me state that you have small business development centers around the DMV, you have our SCORE volunteers, you have our women business centers, and you have our veteran centers that will help businesses, you know, prepare the information they need for PPP or for the idle loan program. It's our tax dollars at work, all right, where the, where the SBA will fund these organizations and you can go 
get help for free. So please do not pay anybody $8,500 to help you put together the information to apply for the PPP or EIDL program. Now, the use of funds, I think by now we all know that it's for payroll, including benefits, mortgage payment, the interest on the mortgage payment, rent, and utilities. Let me stop here and define what utilities are because people are getting out of control with utilities. The internet is not a utility. I repeat, the internet is not a retail utility. Gas, electric, water, and landline business phones right now. It's questionable if cell phones are con considered a utility as of right now today, it really isn't, but we are looking into allowing cell phones to be used to be considered a utility. More to come on that. All right, collateral. There's no collateral required or no personal guarantees. This is unheard of in the history of the SBA and commercial banking because you know banks love to have collateral and they love to have personal guarantees but it's not required under this program. The maturity of the loan is two years. You don't have to make a payment for six months and there is no prepayment penalty. So let's back up and let's repeat. So you can go out and get a new loan today if your business is expanding during this pandemic and the SBA for the first six months will make all principal and interest and fee payments for you. Rod, Rod, so, that's not the PPP, but that's, I'm sorry, Rod. That's the, um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so what I'm doing is just reviewing because I because right. what I'm actually trying to show is that it, these are ways to augment your cash flow. Okay, all right. So, that's how so it, that what you just said was the small business debt relief program. So that was under the small business debt relief program. Mm -hmm. All right. Secondly, under PPP. Well, let's go back to the non, well, for PPP, you don't have to make a payment for six months on this particular loan. For six months, you don't have to make a payment on the PPP loan. Now, for SBA loans, if you currently have an SBA loan, you're going to also ask for deferment for up to six months on that loan. So now we have three ways in which you can actually save on cash flow under the CARES Act. Now, since Kenneth put this slide up, we know that you apply through the financial institutions and fintechs for the PPP loans. Honestly, the, the fintechs have really stepped up and the community banks have stepped up and they're the ones that are actually processing these loans very quickly. I can say to you, and this is already known, that Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank, and the Money Center banks are having, are not processing these loans very quickly. Again, it's the community banks and the fintechs that have really stepped up and are processing these loans very quickly. And Rod, fintechs um, like Intuit and Lendio? Yeah, well, you want more direct lenders like OnDeck, okay. Cabbage, Okay. Those, you know, those type of fintechs. Okay. Yes. Lindio is more of a broker. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Now, if you need a current list of PPP lenders, just go to sba.gov, paycheck protection forward slash find. Now, I can't stress this enough. 75% of the loan funds must be used for payroll to retain workers. You know, I get a lot of questions about, well, can I use that money to, for expansion of my business, for marketing costs and other costs to expand my business? No. If you want the loan to be forgiven, then you must use 75% of it for payroll and the remainder must be used for utilities. Okay. Rod, just to clarify there, I thought you could use it for whatever you want, but the forgiveness is a restriction. Is that well, right? To be frank about it, most people are attracted to the PPP program for the forgiveness right. aspect of it. I just want yeah. to be clear if there was actual restriction on the use of the money or on the forgiveness of the money. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, most people want it forgiven. Okay. And, and frankly, since there's only a two-year um, repayment 
you, that's usually a short window to have to repay a loan, even though it is at 1%. Okay. So I, I'd stick within the parameters of what the program is supposed to be used for. Okay. All right. The next slide, please. All right, we already talked about the um, eligible entities. Mm -hmm. The next slide should be for ineligible entities. No uh, I talked about IDLE, but let's talk about the ineligible entities for PPP. Just remember that gambling casinos are not eligible for PPP. They are also not eligible under the IDLE loan program. And under the IDLE loan program, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan or Working Capital Loan, this is meant to pay accounts payables, payroll, fixed debt, more like utilities. Now, again, the SBA size standards come into play here. So you could have a $30 million, $50 million business in revenue and only have 300 employees. And yes, they are considered small business under the SBA size standards. Now, I think I, the IDLE program is best suited for 1099 independent contractors, sole proprietorships, and single member LLCs. And we do know already that nonprofit organizations, including religious organizations, can also apply for this regardless of their size. And again, MGM Grand, um, Worcester Casino up in Maryland, Maryland Live, Horseshoe, they are not eligible for this program. And for those people, I keep getting questions now, more and more questions about people who gamble for a living that filed the 1040 with the Schedule C. I keep getting questions, are they eligible since they're actually a sole proprietorship? The answer is no, because 100% of their um, income is derived from gambling. So although they are self-employed, they are considered a gambling concern. Next slide, please. All right, so how do I apply? Now, please pay attention to this. So you go to sba.gov and you'll see it'll come up idle and you go ahead and apply in the idle on the idle portal. Now here is something that people didn't understand. They were hearing that they would just automatically get $10,000 regardless of anything. It would be a $10,000 grant. No, it's $1,000 per full-time equivalent or part-time equivalent. Okay. Up to, $10,000 that will be forgiven in its entirety. Now, the applicant is entitled to that advance, which, we, which will be forgiven whether or not they're approved for the loan. The interest rate on these loans are 3.75% for small businesses and 2.75% for nonprofit organizations. This is another thing that's unheard of for SBA and the banks for commercial loans. They're giving up the 30-year terms, 30-year repayment terms. That's unheard of for the SBA or banks for that matter, for commercial loans. With the first payment due 12 months after the loan is issued. So here's another way to free up cash flow. You don't have to make a payment for the first 12 months on this loan. So for the idle loan, you don't have to make a payment for the first 12 months. Under PPP, you don't have to make a payment for the first six months. Under the debt relief program for a new loan, the SBA is actually going to pay, make the loan payments for you. And then the OCC and the FDIC have informed the banks that whether you have an SBA loan or a non-SBA loan, you can defer those payments for up to six months. So here you have four different ways in which you will have a loan where your cash flow is eased because you don't have to make payments for either six months or for 12 months. All right, so you go to the SBA online at IDLE, which is SBA, what's, there you go, well, SBA, you can go to COVID-19 relief, sba.gov, and you will, you know, see the application for IDLE. At this point, the IDLE portal is closed for small businesses. 
We right now are process, we have over 4 million applications to process. And the only ones that are allowed to now apply are the agricultural businesses, short for farmers. The farmers are now right now able to apply for idle, but the other businesses right now cannot, ap cannot apply because actually we're trying to catch up on those 4 million applications that the program currently has. Now, mind you, IDLE has just been funded, I guess, a week, almost a week ago with $60 billion. And again, PPP has been funded in round two with $310 billion. Next slide, please. All right, the last one, the SB Express bridge loan. Now, you have to go to the bank to apply for this loan. Typically, the lender has to be an XBA Express lender. Now, you have 7A lenders, you have SBA Express lenders, some banks can do both. But so you'll have to find out which banks are doing SBA Express lending. Now, under the CARES Act, the SBA Express bridge loan has been expanded from a cap of 350,000 up to $1 million under the CARES Act, okay? And that's not widely publicized at all either. Now, you would use this, this bridge loan because you've applied to IDLE and while you're waiting for IDLE, you do need some funds to, you know, get you through until you get the approval for IDLE, whether that is the actual loan and the forgivable advance. Repayment for this bridge loan is really coming from the idle program or the idle loan. So those funds are to be used to pay, you know, the idle to pay the um, SBA Express bridge loan back. Now, let me, this is Rod's opinion. So I'm off the FBA script here. Since I have the, if I'm an owner, since I have the ability to go ahead and apply for idle, and or the PPP, because you can apply for both, then I would rather apply for both, be in the queue. And typically what's happening is that people are getting the up to $10,000 advance very quickly. So I would take advantage of getting that advance, knowing that it's forgivable and, and still keep my, fund, keep my company operating versus having this interim step of applying for the bridge loan and waiting. But here again, this is another opportunity that you have to get a quick $25,000 into your company until you, know, you wait for the idle loans to come through. Next slide, and this should probably be it. Yes, all right, so we can open it up. Ah, one last thing. I think I should mention the Federal Reserve has just bought online the Main Street Loan Program. It's been funded up to $750 billion. The minimum loan amount is $500,000. Companies up to $5 billion in revenue can apply. Companies now can have up to 15,000 employees. The pricing is LIBOR plus 300 basis points, which is actually anywhere from 2.5 to 4% depending on what library is on that particular day. Here again, the loan payments are deferred for a year. Loan payments are again deferred for a year and these funds must be used to maintain your payroll. Now I know a question is gonna come up, well, can I get IDLE, the PPP, and the Main Street program? Can I apply to all three? The answer is absolutely yes. You can, all right? But unlike the other two, there is no forgiveness. It's strictly a loan. And the repayment of the loan is actually four, is a four-year payback. So this is strictly a loan that you can get from the Federal Reserve, who's already funded it to the tune of $750 billion. And so that's it. Let's open it up for questions, Ken. Okay, uh, Rod. And so there's several came in. One is a bit of a challenge. Someone is saying that the actual CARES Act does uh, specifically say internet, uh, uh, internet 
connections are considered a utility. You want to comment on that? You... When it first, in the first iteration that, that we saw, the internet wasn't considered a utility. So now it may have been up recently updated in the interim ruling, but initially it wasn't. And actually, as of last Friday, when we had the discussion internally, um, I was told that, yeah, they may include the internet, but for what we knew um, at that time, when it comes for the forgiveness period, depending on who the lender is, they may or may not include the internet as a utility. Okay. So I've been kind of very conservative with the, with the answer. Stick with what we know, which is water, gas, electric, right, as your, as your utilities. Okay, and then two related questions. So if I understand you right, today, right now, if you've not applied to a PPP, as for a PPP loan, you can do so. Is that what you're saying? You can do so, yes. And there is money to fund that. There is still money available. Great. Yes. And then the, other, the follow-up question is about guidance on the documentation required when you go about asking for forgiveness. When will guidance on that come out? All right, well... There hasn't, as we know, guidance hasn't occurred, but what I'm telling businesses is to make sure um, that you have your 941s, that hopefully what you've done, if you've, when you receive funding, you will have already opened a checking account at the bank so that the PPP funds are segregated. And so that bank can see that you've made the interest payment on the mortgage or lease or rent payments, and you've made the utility payments out of that account and the payroll for those eight week period of time was also run out of that account because then you have doc the documentation right there. The bank statements will tell you or show the bank how you use the funds and there shouldn't really be any question about the use of the funds so that the loans can so that the loan can actually be forgiven. I see. And then uh, someone said they got an email uh, on Sunday morning at 1.33 a.m. from news at updates.sba.gov. Mm -hmm. And they hadn't applied about idle loans being, and there, it said their idle loan was still being processed, but they hadn't applied to an idle loan as far as they know. Should they be con concerned about people stealing their identity or about this being a phishing or some mistake? Yeah, there is some fraud going on out there. The phishing, phishing is definitely going on out there. That's, that's for sure. Um, now, here's something that's of concern we've had and which I've actually asked business owners to stay away from, which was they would apply to like four or five different banks, okay? And so then they would get a notice from the banks, four banks, at least four of the banks that said that they were either kicked out or declined not knowing that the fifth bank has probably approved them because the e-trans system of the SBA is looking for, you know, duplicate EIN numbers. Now, fortunately, um, customers haven't been completely kicked out of the system and, and having to go to the back of the line because at one time that was occurring. So what's happening now is if they've been approved by one bank, the automatically the E-Tran kicks them out if the other four are trying to process that, that loan. So what I've asked customers to do is just apply to a FinTech and don't apply anywhere else because the FinTechs are actually processing these things pretty quickly. Okay. And then we don't have to worry about which bank actually did the approval or okay. fraud for that matter. And the, um, okay. Thank you. And then uh, I was just checking the other questions. Um, there's still some confusion. One question about use of funds for idle and PPP. Um, as I understand it, while I, I understand you're very much encouraging the PPP money to be used for uh, the things that you can for, be forgiven for, people are not going to be in trouble for using it for other purposes in either case, the idle of PPP, is that correct? Uh, but they may not get forgiveness. Well, we know they're not gonna get forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Just as long as they understand 
that they have to pay that loan within basically now 18 months, mm -hmm. they can handle a 18 month repayment period. Okay. As long as they understand that under PPP, frankly, under idle, I mean, you got a 30 year repayment period, but you should be using the funds as the program, the programs were designed. Okay. And, and we're going to, someone's quoting the CARES Act. So I'm going to give you that quote uh, later about the internet issue. And um, we will, if you come back to us on that with additional guidance, we'll make sure we tell everyone, or we could even add a slide to your deck on yep. that, if there's any clarification on that. Um, which of the loans are now op only open to farmers? That's the idle, is that correct? The idle, yes. Okay, great. So if you already have a number in, a number back from the SBA for the idle, you may still get it. Yes. And you can apply for the, ex the express loan in yes. any case still today. Yes. And even, yes, if you you can't, sure even if you have not ex applied for an idle or only yes. you applied, okay. No, so you yes, get $25,000 for a short-term loan yep. using the express, even though idle, you can't, cannot apply for an idle. That's correct. Now, okay. when, you, when you apply for that SBA express, okay, then ultimately we're looking for idle to pay off that SBA express loan. So apply for the SBA Express, but when I, if you haven't already applied for Idle, when Idle opens up, then you'll go ahead and apply for the Idle. If you've already applied for the Idle and you've received that that Idle number, you can still apply for the SBA Express and just use the funds once you get funded to pay off the SBA Express loan. I see. Um, yep. Trudy yep. has a question about that email she got, news at updates.sba.gov. Does that sound like a legitimate email to you is that you're sending from? or is News.update? News mm. at updates.sba.gov. So it should be sba.gov forward slash updates. Well, this is an email address. So it's news so it's at updates.sba.gov. It, I haven't heard that email address i just haven't okay great so you know that um okay and so any other questions that we'll go open mic now anyone has any questions for any of the panelists uh we'll do sba questions first so hi i have a question mm -hmm. um, hi um as far as the SBA uh, for the 7A series loans, where the SBA is coming in and paying six months worth of the fees and the interest and the principal, mm -hmm. is this loan forgivable at the end of the time period? No, it's not. So it's actually a brand new loan that you're taking out for typically expansion. And so actually all the SBA is doing is saying, okay, we understand that during this time, you may be able to expand based on, depending on what you're doing, what your industry is. So we're gonna go ahead and just pay for the first six months of that. But let's just say you have a 10 year term that you got a 7A loan and that the terms are a 10 year payback. Well, the SBA is just gonna pay the first six months of it and that's it. So no, it's not forgivable. And you have to apply for it by September 27th, 2020. Okay, I want to invite John Nolan to clarify his question. It, it seems he feels it's still a little bit unclear to him. John, can you go on mic and clarify your question? Or, okay, it looks like John doesn't have mic access for some reason. Um, he is asking, uh, okay, when will they be coming out with rules around PPP loan funds that were not spent during the eight week period? And I think what you said was it just becomes a loan that you have to pay back if it wasn't spent during the eight week period where forgiveness is a possibility, depending All on- All right, that. so I'm gonna give you, that's the standard answer, okay? Mm -hmm. That is the standard answer per SBA. Okay. But let's think about this. We know that when you think about the eight week period, it'll probably run past June 30th, okay? according to the CARES Act. Because a lot of people did not get money till later. Exactly. 
Exactly. Okay. So you can't hold people hostage to that June 30th date. So I would imagine from a common sense standpoint that they have to extend the date beyond June 30th. They just have to. Okay. It just seems that they would have to do that. So, so the forgiveness expenditures are, which are eligible have to occur between the day you receive the money and eight weeks yep. from that date. Right now there's a restriction that ends that period on June, June 30th regardless, but you're predicting it will be lifted. Yes, I, I think that would be the sensible thing to do. Yes. Okay. And then can, can you verify that it is only for the idle loan that a company must already have suffered financi financially already? In other words, but, you, and not for the PP loan? All right, look, for idle, everybody has been impacted in some way. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, that's an easy qualification. Everybody's been impacted. So I, I wouldn't be so concerned about that because everybody has in some way, shape, or form been impacted by idle. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, by um, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so um, for any of these, there's no real proof of impact except when it comes to perhaps forgiveness under PPP. Is that correct? Under, right. That's, that's right. Now, I'm surprised people haven't asked me the question, how you use PPP and the idle in unison and actually use the PPP to pay off idle so that you have a forgivable loan under PPP. Okay. So that should have been a question. All right. Okay. So, Okay, Here's, so you can't use the, both of the programs for the same purpose, that is payroll, okay? So what you do is when you get the idle funds, use that for accounts payable and, your, and the utilities. Now, when you get the PPP loan, both of the PPP loan is large enough that you can pay off the idle loan and now, as long as 75% of the PPP was used for payroll, the idle loan that you paid off now becomes eligible, and the, and the PPP loan becomes now 100% forgivable. Okay, so you're saying if you got idle money first and then PPP, and yes, you spend idle on payroll and rent, yep. then you can pay off the idle with the PPP, so long as you do it within the eight-week period, and that becomes forgivable. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Okay. And then um, another question is, if you got idle and it's under $10,000, is that just forgivable? But I think you were saying it's $1,000 per employee, so you'd have to have 10 employees. Is that right? Up to 10 employees. So, for example, if you have, let's just say you have 15 employees, then you would be cut off at 10000 because it's 1000 per employee. And if so you that's five, forgivable. It would be 5,000 so, cut off, right? Well, no, because the, the first 10 employees is $1,000 per employee up to 10,000. So actually, you'd have 10 employees, 10 of your 15 employees covered right. by, the, by, the, by the advance. Yes. But if you, it was five, you've had five employees, then it would mm -hmm. be 5,000 forgivable. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. Any other questions or anything we didn't get to? All right. So here's a question from me. So the question should have been asked. If oh. I'm a single member LLC. You send me these questions so I look smart, Rod. Not that from yourself. Go ahead. If you're a single member LLC. And now I'm just, you know, actually, because I get questions on some of these other ones, other um, seminars. So if you're a single member LLC, can you get the $1,000? Yes, you can. So if you're a sole proprietor, single member LLC, or 1099, you know, miscellaneous, quote, um, business person, then yes, you will get $1,000 advance that's forgivable on top of whatever the loan amount is. Okay, Rod, I got one for you. Here's a question you should be telling us is it should be a question. How fast do you get that express $25,000? Is that pretty much, I put in my numbers and within a week I get it? Does express mean a week or two or? All right, so honestly, the SBA Express is actually 
a faster process than the 7A, okay? So you can, yes, I can safely say that typically you could get that express loan in this day and time within a week. Under normal times, you could actually get it within a day, but because of the times that we're in, it's about a week process. Okay, and, and Linda is asking, if we got the PPP loan before the idle, can we use, still use PPP funds to pay off the idle, but then it depends on how the idle spent, if it's forgivable, is that right? I would, you can use as, you can use the PPP funds to pay off idle. Let's just make sure that it's for different expenses that you use the idle funds for, right? So again, accounts payable, the utilities, um, that's what you're gonna use the PPP to pay off. And then use the remainder PPP for your, for your um, employees. Okay. And could Mr. Johnson address the comments being thrown about by Senator Marco Rubio to scare people into returning the PPP loan funds? All right. So I think they have, what's today? May 6th? Mm -hmm. I think today is May 6th. Mm -hmm. All right. So those guys that he's... It's not May the 4th. Otherwise, we'd be saying, may the 4th be with you. <laughs> okay. So, Yes. He's strong arming those guys. They have until May seventh to return to return the funds. Um, who who? I'm sorry. Who has to? So, so like the so like the bigger companies that have applied. So like some of the colleges and universities that have applied and, and received funds. I think Shake Shack has agreed to actually return some of the funds and some of the larger companies um, because it's a PR nightmare for them to you know, hold on to the funds. The, the way that I look at it is under the SBA regs and rules, those companies actually qualify. And if you're a CFO, I mean, I know this is not a popular opinion, but if you're one of those CFOs, I think you have to tell your CEO that you're eligible under the SBA guidelines to apply for the PPP. And so some of these organizations have thousands of employees. And so would you want those thousands of employees to go on unemployment or would you to, you know, clog up an already clogged up unemployment roles or would you rather have the company keep them on the payroll? And just because a company may have 50 million, 20 million in reserves, if you divide that number by the number of employees and how long they have to try to keep them on the payroll, that's not really a lot of money. So again, if I'm the CFO, it, I would have to tell my CEO based on the SBA regs, we, you know, we qualify. And then you have some, some big companies which whose names are escaping me who have come out and said, just what I've said, we qualify under the SBA regs and no, we're not returning the funds. And they're not worried about the PR fallout. Okay. And anyone else? Open mic. Unmute yourself. Chime in. Last questions? Oh, okay. Uh, here's one from Sam Reen, Sam Reen again. Um, our bank turned off the payments itself and sent a, out a notice the SBA will pay six months of interest in principal. Is the sum of these six months worth of payment forgiven, worth of payment forgiven, not the whole SBA loan? Just asking about the SBA six month payments, is that taxable? So is so that wait, or are we, okay. So are we talking about the deferment on non-SBA and SBA loans or which? An existing 7A loan. All right, so for an existing 7A loan, uh, all right, so those six months worth of deferments are actually gonna be tacked on to the back end of the loan. So you will eventually pay it, it's just gonna be tacked on at the end. Okay. Okay. Sam Reen, does that answer your question? Do you want to get on mic and clarify? Yes, it does. So they're just increasing the, the loan amount at the end. Um, there's no question of forgiveness or taxability because it's just, we still have to pay it. You still have to pay it. It's just being tacked on at the end. Right now, they're just trying to help you with during a six month time period, like right now, they help ease your cash flow. Thank you. 
Okay, and I'm suggesting Trudy, who thinks that's a real email, to uh, call the SBA number here and track to see if there's a record of her applying and you know, perhaps someone has pl applied in her name or something like that. So, mm, okay. I, she's getting an email saying you applied, but didn't, doesn't think she applied. And she, it is, she's saying it's, she's Googled and that is an email address for the SBA. I think All right. So, I I, that. so what we're going to, so what she should do, and I don't know if she did this in the beginning, mm -hmm. because toward the end of the process, they're going to ask for, you know, the bylaws, articles, and certificate of good standing. No, but she didn't apply. She says she didn't apply. But she's she sure she hasn't applied. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. So well, we have to look in. So there are two things I'm, I'm going to um, check out. One is the, um, now the internet being included as a part of utilities. And then the other... I want to find out about this because I want to know if this is a phishing scam in this last instance that, that we're talking about where she says she didn't apply. Okay. I will ask her to send me the email and I will send it on to you. Good. And uh, Trudy, I'm, I'm giving you, I'll just give everyone my email address. Um, one thing that there was something about the um, deductions. Could you clarify that? That came out this past week. Um, deduction. IRS ruling about deducting expenses that are paid with funds that are forgiven under PPP. And for us non-financial types, this is making our head spin. So I think what that was saying was you can't deduct it twice. In other words, I don't pay taxes if I pay rent. I don't pay, the business doesn't pay taxes on money I use to spend rent. So no. the fact that I got money in to pay that, I'm not paying taxes on that. Oh, you're not, no, you're not going to be taxed. Okay. No, no, I get it. Is she going to be taxed on that money that she received? No. Okay. Um, Stu, um, do you have any follow-up on that? Stu, Stu, can, sorry. Can, let me clarify. The IRS announced yesterday in a notice that said, you can't claim a deduction for payroll, which is forgiven by the PPP loan. Because that, that way you have a double benefit since you're not taking the PPP loan into income. If it's right. canceled, they are not allowing you to deduct any expenses. Uh, that's the point. Okay. Got it. Yes. That's right. Yes. Now I got it. What you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So essentially we give our accountant, here's what we paid for the PPP loan and here are our expenses and take those expenses out. Is that what we're basically saying here? We give our yeah, credit. you're not allowed. Those yeah. expenses would not be deductible. Right. But we That's give correct. a separate sheet for those expenses when we give them our expenses. In other words, we take, if I say, you know, here's my internet, or here's my, non my lease expenses for the year, right? I first take that out of anything that I've gotten forgiven from PPP. Take out of that anything I've gotten forgiven from PPP. For PPP. A separate right. list. Here's what's forgiven from PPP for your information. Right. There you go. Okay. Great. And then I'll let the CPA worry about that. So I don't have to. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Rod. Appreciate it. I hope everyone enjoyed this. We will be posting this online. And Rod will be back next week as well to continue answering your questions uh, after we talk about management of, virtual, of remote employees. And I think that will address the non-technical issue issues around employee management when they're working remotely. Thank you, everyone. I'm concluding for today. Thank you, Rod, for staying a bit after. I appreciate it. Appreciate everyone that stayed a bit after. Thank you.